The last lecture module recounts how Goodman entertains and ultimately rejects four proposals for differentiating law-like from contingent or accidental generalizations. In this module, we want to turn our attention to the way in which Goodman refines his formulation of the problem towards the end of the chapter and his diagnosis of Hume's fundamental misunderstanding of what is commonly called the problem of induction. After considering those four proposals, Goodman says that he hasn't found an answer for distinguishing law-like from accidental or contingent generalizations, but he has further refined the problem. He now understands the problem as an instance of a more general problem, the problem of distinguishing projectable from non-projectable predicates. This problem is, in fact, the new riddle of induction. While he's confident that no solution to the this problem has emerged in the chapter. He thinks that there are other approaches that we might take to solving this problem. And it's here that we really see the elements of Goodman's thesis coming together. At its foundation, the notion of a projectable predicate is just the notion of a viable universal or type for the purposes of hypothesis formation. Ultimately, then, the new riddle of induction is really both an argument for his nominalism and a challenge to find a means of making his nominalism viable. His essay really attempts to show that Hume's ontologizing of induction as a problem of somehow showing that the future will resemble the past is a mistake on Hume's part, or at least on the interpreters of Hume. For Goodman, Hume errs in forgetting that his own theory shows that one's concepts are one's own creations based upon one's own habits of mind as much as upon one's experiences. The problem of induction, then, is to explain how habit and experience combine to create useful concepts for the purpose purposes of categorization and inference, and to differentiate the cases in which they do and the cases in which they do not. I personally think that Goodman actually misunderstands Hume in some ways and fails to see how Hume could respond to his criticisms and in other ways merely recapitulates Hume. At the end of the chapter, we can now see that Gru is just a predicate designed to violate the principle that the future will resemble the past. We notice, too, that it isn't a legitimate predicate for Hume, since we can't have an idea of Gru in immediate experience. This also provides us with a response to Goodman that he doesn't seem to consider at all. Goodman focuses on law-likeness and does not consider whether Gru is actually confirmed by our observations of emeralds before T. It seems as if Gru proves undetectable before T, making the emeralds or Gru hypothesis unconfirmed, and it's unclear whether Goodman can avoid this response. Now, Goodman does consider positional and qualitative predicates, but his attempt to formulate that response purely in terms of differentiating them linguistically, i.e. syntactically, is a fundamental mistake on Goodman's own part. Hume has other means by which to respond to Goodman. He doesn't have to accept Goodman's ontological views in order to respond to Goodman. Hume merely needs to note that in order for us to have a ordinary concept of Gru, it has to appear to us in immediate experience. We can have a matter of fact all emeralds are Gru, but we couldn't possibly believe it because we have no experience of emeralds going from green to blue at time t, and hence this is a non-problem for Hume. Now, Goodman might respond by saying that while Hume may have a response to the Gru case, Hume fails to see that sometimes experiences seem to confirm generalizations and other times they do not. But Hume needn't accept this either. Recall that Hume's theory of belief, for all its problems, has a mechanism for differentiating beliefs with respect to their relative evidential bases. Recall that believing is to have an intensity or vibrance in one's conception that can only be cultivated through strong connections to actual experiences. As a result, Hume can use the notion of the strength of a belief to differentiate between well-evinced and poorly evinced hypotheses or matters of fact. And so he can, in fact, differentiate between the poorly 
advanced groundskeeper willy hypothesis that we begin our discussion of this sort of problem with, and more highly advanced hypotheses like the ideal gas law. They can cultivate beliefs, but those beliefs can be differentiated quite easily in terms of the vivacity with which they are brought into our mind, in terms of the degree of belief that we have. And so Hume can accept that we get confirmation of generalizations by instances, but that confirmation is proportional. And so the groundskeeper willy kind of generalization will never gain an, enough of an evidential base to actually rival anything like the idea gas law. Accidental generalizations can get confirmations, but they can't actually be confirmed to the point of being accepted as generalizations. And that would be, I think, Hume's response. And it's a response I don't see Goodman has a decent answer to at all.